has been a really good um, retreat. You guys are very blessed to have such a wonderful fellowship of, of people to be with. So it's good. You know, get in there and do your part. Um, a lot of times in church, <clears throat> the ladies are the ones. You know, it, it is our personality. And this is not my, my talk yet. But the ladies are the, the people who add the spice or add the trouble. You know what I mean? It can be either way. So don't be that. Um, I don't know about you, but <clears throat> even in my own home, <clears throat> I don't love everything about it. I would change some things, right? You would always change some things. After our family comes over, I'm always critiquing, you know, that could have gone better. I should have set this up better if I'd been more prepared here. If, if, if. Well, the church is going to be like that too. Because we're people that come in, we're bringing in everything, right? We bring in good baggage, we bring in bad baggage. And together we work through those things. But just like... Let's just say I have a family member that comes over and maybe doesn't engage very much in conversation. I'm not going to take that family member and toss them aside, right? Maybe they had a bad day, right? Well, that's the same thing with the church. We don't toss people aside. Really, we don't get rid of our family. You know, I'm not going home today, but man, we got 16 in our family, but... <clears throat> this person, you know, just doesn't fit. You know, you're not a part of it anymore. Or, or they don't say, you know, I'm not going to be a part of the family anymore. Why? They're my children, my in-laws, and my grandchildren. They're a part of our family. Well, that's the way church is. We're a part of the same family. And so the grass is not green or two miles down the road. I don't know of a church two miles down the road, but I'm just, just in case that was your family church somewhere... You know, I, the grass is not greener. Get in here and do your part and let the preacher know you can count on me. You know, um, during this pandemic, a lot of things have happened in our church. One of them is we lost 70 uh, kid life workers in our children's ministry. Seven zero. That's a lot of people. You know why? Because we found out that without as big of a schedule, we can relax a little bit more, right? We can just chill. Oh, that was nice not having to serve. I think I'll just come back slowly and listen and, you know, grow. And, but we have to have workers. We have to have workers in the church. So you do your part. And the Lord will bless you for it. I don't mean overwork. I just mean do your part. What is your part? Think about that. It's not our session. We're going to get in marriage here, but, <clears throat> but what is my part? Now, you are not expected to do your part plus 10 more people. Your preacher wouldn't expect that. But what is my part? What can I do? You say, well, I cannot teach that Sunday school class. Well, you know what? The preacher probably didn't even have that in mind if you feel like you can't teach it because maybe God didn't gift you there or maybe he did, but you're not ready. But what can you do? How can you serve? There's a lot of things to do. And you can get in there. There's the cleanup today. And you say, well, i got to buy groceries. Everybody does. But you know what? If we all do our part, it's wonderful. So uh, what a great group of people that you guys have. And, and uh, if we ever come back again, I hope to see your face again. And then you pick up where you left off and get to know each other just a little bit better. All right, the weave of marriage. Um, before there were ever um, 16 of us, there were two. There were two. My husband and me. And that makes up a family. You understand that when we had our first child, that's not when the family began. The family began on July 27, 1979 with two of us. In 1984, we added a child. In 1986, we added a second child. And in 1989, we added a third child. Our family began to grow. And then our, in 2005, we added a first um, in-law, a daughter-in-law. We had to learn to adapt to that. That was very different. 
There's been five of us. Our family lives in Alabama. We live in North Carolina. It was just us. And I had to learn to have a, a fourth child. And then in um, 2008, we added a second daughter-in-law. In 2010, we added a son-in-law. So there we were with eight adults, and now we've grown to eight more grandchildren, and there's 16 of us. So what is, why I'm telling you that, <clears throat> do you guys get frogs in your throat here? I got a frog. Hold on just a second. Nothing hot tea won't cure, right? Just a little warm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, so the 16 of us grew out of what? Out of two. If that two is not woven tightly, beginning in 1979 and beginning the weave that I'm about to talk about, as we go to three, four, five, 14, 15, 16, we become functional beings operational systems with no connection. So, when there were five of us, and now let's, instead of adding to the family, because that's what we've tried to do, let's subtract and say, okay, now our home of five and one gets married, there's a home of four, right? There's a home of three, there's a home of two, uh, back, back down to two. When that happens... What is there? Is there communication like we talked about last night? Is there love? Is there openness? Is there happiness? Is there joy? Do you feel like you can joke around? Or does it make the other person upset? Does it make you upset, me upset? So that's where we are in our marriage. That's why I understand a little bit about the weave because a basket, has anybody ever seen a basket that's been woven? It's the coolest thing. Um, in Hawaii, um, we saw a, a man take a leaf, leaves off of a tree, lay them out, and weave this basket. And I'm still mad because my husband wouldn't let me stand there and buy it. He said, oh, we'll get one when we come out of the rainforest. Yeah. Guess what? He wasn't there, and I wanted that basket. I didn't even care how much it cost because I knew how I looked at that basket. Anyway, I got a different basket on a second trip that we took um, with our children, but it's just a little bit different because I didn't see it woven. You know what I'm saying? But that man was taking a leaf, and you know what he didn't have? He did not have a needle and thread. He said, oh, you know what? I better stitch this leaf together right here, and then I'm rubbing. You know what? I think I'll put a reinforcement stitch right here. The basket was woven so well that it held itself together. So you ladies, us as women, we are half of the weave. You can't weave with just, just you, you got to have a weave. you got to have two things going on at one time at least, right? You can braid a hair with two or three, or you understand. But you can't really braid with one. You can twist it, but it's going to look twisted. But a weave is different. And you picture that weave. We are one half of that weave. So... The Bible clearly talks about it, and I'm not going to spend too much time here, but I, I want you to, to look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, because it's le the verses I'm going to point out to you are leading into the marriage relationship. And, you know, if, do you, I do this all the time. You know, I'll read a passage, and I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And you wonder why does the Lord say these things? And then you begin to go back up in the verses and realize why God says what he says. So in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, and we could go all the way back up, but, but we're not going to. Okay, verse 18 is talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're a journaler, 
I would really, and if you're not, I would still suggest it because it will help you remember what you study in your devotions. I would simply write here, Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. That's what I'd put in my journal. Ephesians, 19, Ephesians 5.19 says, speaking to yourselves and making melody in your heart. You know what? Some self-talks are good. Anybody talk to themselves? My mama, she used to be across the sink, and we got a window above, because when you add on, you just kind of leave that hole open. You're looking over there, and I'd be like, when I grow up, I am not doing that. And guess what I do? That. <laughs> Look, okay, quit talking to myself right now. People are here. Speaking to yourself. Have some spiritual self-talks. Now look at this progression. Verse 20 talks about giving thanks. Verse 21 talks about submitting yourselves one to another one to another in the fear of God. Verse 22 says, wives. Now, we started off in verse 18 to be filled with the Spirit. We've progressed through speaking to ourselves and making melody. We've, we've progressed to giving thanks. We've progressed to uh, submitting yourselves to one another. See, it's easy for me to submit to you. Yes, what do you want me to do? Sure, I'll be glad to. Uh-huh. You want me to do what? Don't you? <sighs> sure, I'll be glad to. And we we'll walk off and we're like, good night. Don't even realize what I've got to do before tomorrow. Right? Oh, you know why we laugh? Because we all understand it. So verse 22, why submit yourself unto your own husbands? Preacher, you want me to do what? <sighs> Thank Yes! Okay, it's going to be hard tomorrow, but I can do it. Husband, you want me to do what? Don't you realize what is on my plate right now? And look what you've just put on me, right? It's so easy to another husband who just believes in us because we're the one that does it the best, you know? But when our husband thinks we do it the best, it's a little different story. So wives, submit to your own husbands. Verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Verse 24, therefore the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. Verse 25, husbands love your wives. Yes, 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 husbands love your wives. Why? Because he might sanctify and cleanse it. It's talking about the church still and the marriage relationship, I think is a secondary thought. Verse 27, God wants a glorious church. Now tell me, who makes up the church? Do husband and wives and families and singles, and, okay, right? So how does, how does Christ get a glorious church? In you and me. The church is not this, this beautiful facility, and it really is. But when nobody's here, it's just a building. But we make up the glorious church, okay? So then, verse 28 is talking, and it goes right on down through, but we're going to skip to, uh, to husbands what to do with their wives. So, but in verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. You say, well, he never left. Well, he might not have. I understand that is a problem sometimes. And shall be joined to his wife. We're cleaving together. And the two shall be one flesh. That is the weave we want to talk about today. The weave doesn't just happen. I could, I could name you people that I look at and think, they, they, they've never woven together. They've never made it to that. They might have been married 20, 30, 40 years, but they live separate lives. Now, it's never too late. Is it more difficult if you do it later on? Absolutely. Anything is, right? It's always more difficult, my mom said, to remake a garment than it is to make a garment. Anybody sew in here? I sewed one little pair of, of a little uh, shorts for my daughter, and she was young, and I said, Oh, God, if you gave me a daughter, if you give me a daughter, I'll sew, and I'll just, you know, and I made this little pair of, of um, uh, culottes, and they're big, they, they looked awful. 
And she looked awful at him, and I said, oh, God, as long as there's nice hand-me-downs, I won't be doing that again. Thank you for the daughter. <laughs> and no way. It was awful. It was absolutely awful. Um, so, so God is saying here, verse 32, this is a great mystery. It is a mystery what we're talking about right now. How opposites attract, how God said a man and a woman are very different, but if you do this and you weave together, it's beautiful. But you know what we do? Proverbs 14, 1. And this is where your handout will begin. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but a foolish woman plucketh it down with her hands. Now I want you to picture the perfect scenario in your home. Oh, I wish it were like this. If we just had, if we just operated this way, you know, the husband, the wife, the perfect dog, the little white fence, the grass that looks awesome, the clean house, and you come in in the afternoon and, and you put your feet up and as you look around, it looked like it came right out of Better Homes and Gardens and, and Joanna Gaines had come in and just taken care of it and it, it, was, it was, oh, it was just, and you still had money in the bank and, and yeah, I did not paint Somewhere in there your dream fell, right? There was no fussing and arguing, and the children always said, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And, and, and they used their napkin and everything. They even knew how to blow their nose. Isn't that nice? <laughs> I'm just speaking real. <laughs> but you know what we do? We don't take care of our side of that deal. We come in and pluck it down. Go do your homework. I told you three times. I'm not telling you again. Turn that TV off. Why did you put your shoes in the floor? Why did you, oh, yeah. Husband comes in, looks at the paper. Why did you do that? You see me in here slaving. Oh, 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 oh. And that is a picture of biblical plucking down with our hands. Now, I cannot tell you that I'm the perfect wife that never fusses, that never nags. I wish I could. I really would like to say that. But I would be afraid the ceiling would fall in and I would, the plane would crash before I got home. And Because you know what? We are all guilty of sinful things. There is not one perfect home. But are we teachable? Are we willing to change? Oh, man, I blew that, and I want to get it right. So I'm going to give you some ways that maybe just, maybe just one of them will click for you. If you could choose one of these things and operate it uh, to the best of your uh, ability and knowledge, biblical knowledge, and grow through it, then it would be good. So number one, appreciate his desire to protect and provide for you. See, in Genesis 2.15, God told Adam to dress the garden. You know what that meant? It meant to dress the garden. It meant to work. And he took care of his wife, Eve, until they blew it. Well, that is our job, to build our husband up. Thank you. How are some ways that your husbands provide for you? Do they bring home the bacon at all? Uh-huh. Maybe, that, maybe it's a 50-50 thing for you guys. It, a life is different. I understand it's very expensive to live here. So it might be that. But does he provide? And you say, well, you work too much. Well, at least he works. At least he works. And, and so what can you thank your husband and appreciate him for in that? Uh, it used to bug me. It doesn't now. Now it bugs me if he doesn't do it. But uh, my husband, when we're walking down a sidewalk, he always stands next to the road because he would get hit first. Like, that would, I'm like, yeah, right. But you know what? The longer we were married, the more I began to appreciate that. He would just uh, change sides. At first, really, I'm honest. I would just be like, oh, you know, that's what I felt. <laughs> I wouldn't say it, uh, but I did say it. Right, the Lord heard it. Uh, but, you know, that was a plucking down. That was one of his ways 
to protect me. In his way, I'm protecting you from the, you, you stand on the inside, you know. Just little things like that. How does your husband, as your helpmate, protect you? What are some things that he does to make a difference? You know what men do? First thing they do is they say, um, how do you make a living? You know, what's your job? Where do you work, right? Guarantee you, my husband's probably asked every one of your husbands that this week. That's what he does. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, that is awesome. He learned so many things. That's what men do. How do we show appreciation for that? Other people do. There's a woman probably somewhere that's like, I can't believe what a good job you do. You are so good at that. And here we are like, glad you're home. Hey, before we, before we go to bed tonight, this is what we have to do. We gotta clean the garage. We gotta, 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 and you gotta get that oil check. You know that. It, and here we are. So let's appreciate him for who he is and what he does. Number two, show respect to your husband both publicly and privately. Show respect. See, you and I should not be correcting our husband in public. If I, it, it maybe he says, oh, this was um, seven years ago and we did yada, yada, yada. And you're like, that was six years. Don't you remember? Does it matter to the person he's telling? No, it does not matter to the person he's telling. That was a detail they could care less about. It wasn't even a point. Yet we make it a big deal. So we have to show that respect publicly. But it is very important to show it privately. We know the jokes about, I mean, if these videos, we, you know why we laugh at these videos? Because the comedians are true scenarios. Uh, I, we can all laugh. How can we all laugh at the same thing? Because there's a mole for women, like, like this brain thing we watched yesterday. That was the funniest thing ever. Because that is exactly, because that is what I do too. I'm doing it right now. I'm like, you know, you jump over here and like, oh, and before we, and, and he's like, wait, 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 wait. Are we still on the conversation about yesterday? Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking about when we get home tomorrow, how we're going to get the kids and how we're going to, and I'm trying to figure out how to get all my kids for grandparents day tomorrow, all my grandkids, because there's three of them that live an hour away. And I'm like, this grandparents day at our church. Hmm. Okay. I'm doing this, you know. So whatever time I've got to go to Goldsboro tomorrow, I'm figuring this out. But I might say that right in the middle of talking about getting to the airport today. Why? Because that's what women do, right? And oftentimes when we begin to do these things and he doesn't catch on, we show disrespect to him. Show respect. We were going through the airport not long ago, and one of the TSA workers said, oh, 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 ma'am, ma'am. They called me back. I'm like, oh, my word, what did I do? You know, it's how you feel. Guilty. There's the cop. You know, you just feel so. And he said, you forgot your bag. And I said, oh, my husband's getting that. And um, I said, but thank you. And I really thought she was going to drop her jaw because it's not the day that people even husbands, show kindness to their, to their man, to their wife. So let's show respect publicly and privately. A good rule of thumb is to, to ask yourself is, is what I'm about to say or do going to come across to him as respectful or disrespectful? What? What, how's it going to come across? You know, I would never think to myself, okay, hmm, I'm about to disrespect my husband. What are you thinking? That's not what we do, right? But they're little snippets. Now tell me, has any of those little nagging snippets ever changed your husband? Maybe they have. I would love to have that with just one testimony. Just one. <laughs> because you know what? They don't. They don't change the little picky things that we want them to change. So why do it? Love and respect are so important to our, to our husband. Maybe if he could pick the difference and he says, 
between love and respect, he might would put respect above love. Men want to be appreciated and they want to be respected. Number three, allow your husband to lead your home. What? What? <laughs> you see, we're an operating system. Would you agree with me that we are an operating system? Okay. Any of you that might stay, any, any stay-at-home moms? Is there any stay-at-home moms? Okay, we've got a couple. Well, when you have done that, then you are in the situation of you've run your home all day long and your husband comes in and then it's like, okay, I've got to defer to him now because, it, okay, how many people work in the workplace? Okay, people, they're, you're running things, you're doing things, your boss is telling you, you're getting it done and he even gives you a little leadership, you know what I'm saying? And then you get home and we're still clicking it off. And you know what happens in those kind of situations? We bring it home and we lead our husband and we put him right in line with the kids or we put him right in line with the workers on the job and we're clicking it off because you know what we're thinking? Our, operators, our operating system is thinking, okay, by 10 o'clock tonight or by 9 o'clock your, your system is, okay, I've got, we've got to do this, 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 and this and it's got to be done. Okay, these things will be nice but they're not are we going to get done, but I'm going to keep them right here in my mind just in case we can't get to it. Now, what else? And he comes home and he's like, oh, move out of the way. You know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to get in the recliner and get out of her way. I'm just going to go ahead and put the newspaper up, so that's not much anymore, but the screen or something, right? That's old uh, thought. But so that I can tune into my own world, I can get in my box, because if I don't, I'm going to be in her way. And so now what we're doing is we're training our husbands to become vegetables at home. So when we're married 20, 30, 40, 50 years, he can't even get open a box because we don't think he can do it right. And he knows that. And so in order to keep the home from being in turmoil, He'll just step out. And we wonder why we have all the work to do. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about average scenarios. You understand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about uh, uh, an invalid husband or I, I'm not talking about things like that. I'm talking about situations that we have. So we have to allow our husband to lead. We got to step back and let him do these things, support him and praise him and be gracious if he makes a bad decision. Have you ever made a bad decision? It's like last night with the, um, the, um, the questions. That was a pretty good answer, right? He, he, he thinks. Yeah. He's got a good brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get it? Remember that? Uh, that was pretty good. I wish I had said that, right? I tell my husband all the time, man, you always order a better plate of food than I do. Why didn't I order that? It's the way it is sometimes, right? Look at these questions. We won't spend a lot of time on each. These are questions that you need to ask yourself about allowing your husband to lead. Did my husband ever try to lead in our marriage, but I stepped in? Now, Everybody here has a living husband, or you wouldn't be at this retreat. That means it is not too late. If you did step in, you got to figure out how to step out. Number two, did I send him a message that I do not intend to follow him if he makes a decision contrary to what I believe is correct? Do I want my husband to be responsible? But if he is irresponsible, in my opinion, I exercise veto power. Well, we're not going that way. The traffic's too bad this morning. Right? Do I want him to be responsible, but when he is irresponsible, I do that to him? Do my words and actions communicate, you are responsible, but I have the authority? See, 
It's how we come across in the rush, in the Sunday morning rush of getting out the door. It's how we interpret things and what our face shows. Do my, oh, I just said that. Does my husband have to ignore me to be in charge? Now I want you to really think about that. When I've thought through these, they're hard because I do a lot of things that are leadership oriented. My husband and I don't even study the same. I used to run my notes by him and I'm like, I can't get up after he's done because, you know, I don't have three alliterated points and, you know, like he does. They, they don't match and all their stuff. So, so, you know, it's like, okay, you know, we just agree to disagree. Not disagree, but just not worry about it. He does his way, I do mine. But does he have to ignore me? I want to think about that. Think about that. Do I possibly have an attitude of self-righteousness? See, none of us would think that. But do we? I'm not telling you that you do. I'm asking you, do you? Because there are times that I do. I get in that mode and I'm just being real, and I try to get it done, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm like, what are you doing? You know, and he might be doing something very important that he's not run by me, but when I get in that operating system mode, I can just clean house. I can do it all. You know what I mean by that? I can clean our whole house. I can lift and I can push something across the floor when I've really got the momentum to do it and I can rearrange everything, right? We can do it. But that is not best for the weave of our home. Is our husband not helping due to us? Well, I better not touch that till she gets home because if I do, whoo, if it's done wrong. Is that what's happening? Number four, understand his heart as he analyzes and seeks to solve your problems. Oh, gracious. This is a big one. Tell your husband that you would like his ear for the moment and not necessarily his solution. If I complain or talk to my husband about something, he's like, well, why didn't you just tell him? That? I don't, I don't, I know what to do. I'm just talking just like if you and I were talking, right? And we're like, oh my, right? But, but see, they have this thing that they call um, love and help and appreciation. And, and we really don't want his brand of empathy. And that's where we're going with this. Thank him for his advice without acting insulted. Thank you. Thank you, hon. But... You know, we'll work it out. I mean, it's got to be kind. Recognize his problem-solving approach as his male brand of empathy. He's trying to, to help you and enter into this terrible situation with you. But we don't want it. We just want to talk. We just want to talk. Number five. Understand his desire for shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder friendship. I have to rush through that, that one because I want to get to this one. I want you to realize we know who we are, but I want you to see it. Who we are as women and who men are as men. So I need two talkative women. Okay? You got something to say? Come sit down. Don't even tell me there's women in this room that don't have something to say. All right. Here you go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. All right. Come on up. Okay. Uh-oh. Oh, you got to say it in English. I don't even want Spanglish. I don't want to hear it. I'm in charge. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I want you to watch these ladies as they pretend to be men. Men. You're men. You're men right now. Get in the mode. 
Sit like it, be it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. Your men, your men watching a ball game on TV. I'd like to say it was not in the NFL right now. <laughs> okay. You're watching a ball game on TV and you're talking to each other. Go. Okay, their whole conversation, she's like, stop. <laughs> their whole conversation is wrapped around ball game. The whole thing. Yes. Everything is about ball game. Okay, they're looking at the TV screen. Now, when we all get together, do we, do we gather around the TV? I mean, every now and then it might be a ladies' movie night, but not much, you know. That's not what we do. Turn your chairs to face each other. Now, these girls have not seen each other for a couple of months because honestly, they have kids, they're busy, they've got their church work, they have a lot going on. They have got an hour with nobody but themselves and they are so glad to be here and just maybe have some tea or soda, whatever's in your brain like that, a little piece of pie because there's no calories when there's only women and we love that. Okay, here you go. Let us hear you. Sorry, you're doing good, but I want to hear what you're saying. Okay, do you see what they're doing right now? Tell me something they're doing. Okay. I'm sorry? <laughs> they're talking something what? I didn't hear what you said. I don't know. I didn't hear what you okay, said. Okay, what are they? Tell me some. Describe what they're doing right they're now. They're looking at each other. They're looking at each other. Okay, what else? They're smiling. Their body language is forward. Their body language, that's good. It's an exchange. It's an exchange. Are they engaged in, the, in each other? Were the men engaged in each other or engaged in the ball game? Now, would the men have said they had the time of their life? But they learned nothing about each other. They only learned about the bears, right? But, but the, 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 the lady conversation has engaged eye contact. I mean for longer than one second, yes. right? And you know what, their voice tone changed. That's why I had to say, speak up, because I didn't have to tell you to speak up when you were a man. Yeah. But, but you know what I had to do? I had to tell her, y'all speak up, why? Because you know what? They were so excited to just have intimate conversation. Now, hmm, how do I want to do this? I'm gonna turn your chair straight. You stay, no, you stay just like that. This is who we married. See, he was used to, I mean, no offense, I'm just, you know, whatever. Okay, all right, our husbands, they like shoulder to shoulder friendship. Go, this is great, awesome. I've had the time of my life tonight. I've not seen anybody, but I don't even care. This was wonderful. But you know what we want? Eye to eye contact. So, so here's our husband getting all going and here's the wife. Now, try to get your husband's attention. Wow, did you see this? This is amazing.
Okay, now do you see what we just experienced? <laughs> Tell me some things we just experienced. He's still looking at the TV. <laughs> Did he check his calendar about Friday? He said, did he say yes, though? Yes. Well, what if he has a big meeting at work? He probably does. <laughs> he probably does. What else? What else? What else is something? You get, you get the stuff ready. You get the stuff ready. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. His focus was going to the game, right? You know what her focus was? Bringing the kids to the game. His focus was, hey, we'll wear these jerseys. Her focus was, how can we get jerseys for the kids? We, we've just spent about $1,000 on jerseys, just so y'all know right now. <laughs> but you, you see the difference? We married our opposite. So sometimes, I want you to pull your chair a little closer. And almost in front of him. Oh, almost. Pull it about right here. Okay. Like that? Uh-huh. Now, we cannot change our wonderful, loving, appreciated, stubborn husband. <laughs> <laughs> with respect. May, may I say that with love and respect? Okay. We, we, we can't change that. Listen. It's not our job to change it. I try. You ever try? Oh, man. <laughs> do you know how bad I don't like to do this session? <laughs> so hard. But we all need reminders. There's not one lady in here that's perfect. There's, there's somebody that's better than others. I get that. But whatever area we're good at, we're probably weak somewhere else. So therefore, we get rid of our self-righteousness. I know you want me to scratch your back right now, but I'm not. Because <laughs> you'll fall. That's exactly what happens. All right. So we have to keep coming over and getting his attention and getting closer and moving because he is not naturally eye to eye unless he wants sex. <laughs> That's true. Our last point. Okay? Well, this is not natural. That's why Sex Begins in the Kitchen, that, birth, that, that book, is the greatest book ever. If you and your husband want to sit down and read a book together, and you just sit down 10 minutes a night, right before you go to bed or whatever, wind down and read that book, and then you can say, I feel like that. Because we're doing all these things we're talking about. We are the operating system. He's already had a nap. <laughs> and now here we come into the, the... And I'm like, finally. And we're like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm, I'm ready, you know. And, and, and we go, you understand what I'm saying. So thank you, ladies. Y'all were excellent. Absolutely excellent. So understand his desire for that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder friendship and move accordingly. You know what? When we move, he may move as well. That's so, so, so important. Um, tell your husband you like him and show it. Tell your husband you like him. I didn't say love. You get it? I love my husband dearly, but I'll tell you, sometimes I just flat don't like him. You know what I'm saying? Right? Been there. Yep. <laughs> Got it. Respond to his invitation to engage in recreational activities together or go along to watch him. Inside. I played golf a couple of times, and I'm like, only me and God know how many times I've been in these crazy woods hitting this ball that I can't hit. So I finally said, do you mind? I'll be glad to drive the cart which we don't play much anymore because life picks up and moves on. But when we do, I just drive the cart because I can't hit a crazy golf ball for nothing. I need it to be this big. Number six, meet his need through sexual intimacy. Meet his need. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again 
and say, that Satan tempt you not with your incontinency. So what that means is don't say no unless you're fasting and praying. You said, well, I am. I'm fasting and praying. I just started again tonight. I'm fasting and praying. I'm fasting and praying. I'm fasting and praying. No, you're going to shrivel up. We don't want you anorexic. So you can't fast and pray that much, okay? So that means, really, you need to take no out of your, basically, out of the dictionary. But don't you fast between dinner and breakfast? Well, <laughs> breakfast. But not during lunch and dinner. <laughs> You're right. Um, but you understand what I'm saying, right? Okay. Yeah, we do have to keep this subject on the light side or we'll, we'll, we'll all shrink. So we've got to be very, very appropriate um, in what we say and what we do with our husbands. He, you know what? If my husband came home and I found out he had had affair, an affair, I would be broken. Well, what is my part in keeping him from having that affair? I need to be there. I need to say yes. You know what? If the kids call out at night, you know what we do? We jump up, we go, we take care of them, we read them a story, we put them back to bed or whatever your routine might be. And our husband calls out and we say, well, you're not worthy because I am tired. So, I just, just a little, just a little thought, you know, just to be romantic, be romantic. I don't know what your routine would be. We don't talk, you know, that's something you shouldn't share with your friends. It's something you shouldn't, shouldn't overly, but you know, there's not a man in this room unless he has a health condition that does not want his wife to be romantic towards him. There's not very, if, if it's a health condition, that is different. Other than that, we need to be on a page. We need to be dressed properly. Really, your night wardrobe should be nicer than your day wardrobe. You know what? Not one of us would have come in here today with this big old stain on a stretched, huge T-shirt that looks awful. Not one of, you know why? <gasps> because of all of you going to be here. <laughs> well, the very one that we are woven with, that only you and he have this particular relationship. Only, you're one and only and you're only one. Well, I'm ready. I didn't brush my teeth today or didn't comb my hair. Leave your makeup on and look nice. And they're done. So I think I hear them. So I know I need to start out with this point so I know they're done. So, so make sure that, that you're taking care of that area. Understand that he needs sexual intimacy just as you need emotional intimacy. That's why the, the book, Sex Begins in the Kitchen, is so important. See, we want that emotional connection first, and then we don't mind gravitating to the bedroom. But when there's no connection, we mind. Because we felt ignored all night, and we've ignored him all night. We haven't fussed, but we have survived the night. We're not going to fuss, we're checking it off. But if that sex begins in the kitchen, just a little romance, just sweetness and doing things together and the progression goes right to the end, then he is getting his sexual intimacy and we are getting our emotional intimacy. Now I understand I'm p painting a perfect scenario here, but we have to have a goal. Your last statement, it is your responsibility to tighten the weave of your marriage. It's your responsibility. Make it that. And you know what? Without nagging, it's probably just going to catch your husband and move to the next stage for us. Let's never be settled. Let's always be teachable and working on our marriage. Thank you, ladies. You've been good listeners.